Um, we're going to be talking about sections 8.1 to 8.3, but before we get into that, I wore my Pine Tech shirt today, got the, the green on, Google meters, here's the green, um, because I want to remind everybody that when you get your five college credits for this class, you still have to pay for an official transcript. So if you have a planner or some place that you write yourself down, you know, little notes of things to do, because it's going to be summer and you're going to forget, but about two weeks after school is done, you need to request an official transcript from Pine Tech at pine.edu. And what they'll do is that they have a fee, of course, um, but they'll send you an official transcript, and that's the one you need to take to college with you because that'll show that you earned five college credits from them. Now, some of you might be taking other courses at Elk River High School that will also earn you credits through Pine Tech. Um, there are a couple other courses that do that. Gosh, I, right now I can't even think. It might be Spanish that goes through Pine Tech, but there are a couple more. But it, it doesn't hurt to get it now while you remember it and have it ready because it doesn't go into some giant computer in the sky and all the colleges know about it. That's not how it works. Every college has their own official system and their own official transcripts. So that's what you'll need to take with you so that you can get those credits. They may ask you whether or not your instructor was accredited. I absolutely am. Now, we, there are people that teach these courses that are not accredited, but I am accredited through Pine Tech. That means these, trans, these are, are transferable credits. Um, so if you go to North Dakota um, and you say, my instructor was accredited, they will take the credits. Um, if you don't have an accredited instructor, usually they'll say, we won't take the credits because they want you to pay for the courses at, at their school. But I am accredited. So um, sometimes they'll ask, does your instructor have a master's degree, that kind of thing? Just say, my instructor is accredited through the MinSKU system and then you'll be just fine. Um, so official transcripts, a couple weeks after school, give them a couple weeks to get all the grades in and get everything ready for you. And then I also need to let you know that for the chapter eight test that we're gonna take, eight one, eight two, and eight three, there aren't going to be any retakes. The reason is the seniors won't have time to do the retakes because the seniors leave early. So to make it fair, the only thing we can do is say, nobody has retakes on eight one to eight three. It's very algebraic, um, probably not, you know, I'm sure you loved matrices because matrices can be pretty easy once we use the calculator for them. Uh, it's not quite that easy, but it is very algebraic and I don't think you're going to have a lot of trouble with it. So I wouldn't worry about the fact that you're not going to have retakes on that. And then the last thing that we do for the non-seniors is a quiz. So there are never any retakes on quizzes. So um, keep up with everything that we're doing. If at any time you're like, I'm just not getting this, come on in and see me. And we'll make sure that by the time you get to the Chapter 8 test, you're feeling pretty good about it. All right. Any questions about official transcripts, anything like that? Because all of that is done through Pine Tech. So if you just go to pine.edu, you know, it'll lead you through it. Absolutely will. All right, let's get started. Um, chapter 8, is it's a fun chapter. We used to teach this material in Algebra 2. And um, after the state changed all of the standards, we had to kick it out until we had time to get it to you because we had so many things to teach to the standards. And now you get to see this, which is analytic geometry in two dimensions. We're going to talk about conic sections. One of the things I don't like about math is when they make these things pronounced differently than what we would normally think they are. Um, I think it just it makes it uh, less universal for everybody because it comes from a double-napped cone. I would really like if it were pronounced conic, but it's not. It's pronounced conic. So conic sections and parabolas. Today we're going to get a little bit of parabolas in there. Ellipses and hyperbolas. So those are the three sections that we're going to cover. And the oval lawn behind the White House is a great place to start looking at this because it is an elliptical shape. Now, an ellipse is a fancy math name for an oval. That's what this is. So there's this big oval back here that they have. And it turns out there's, there are reasons for that, more indoors than outdoors. But um, it's just a, a beautiful shape 
that, <laughs> of course, we have numbers for, and we could do everything mathematically for that. In fact, we will later on in the chapter. So our overview is that we're talking about analytic geometry, which combines number and form. And it grew from the works of Frenchman René Descartes and Pierre de Fermat. Uh, Fermat was a really famous mathematician because he had developed a proof, a geometric proof for something, and he never finished it. And so it took years and years. In fact, it was just probably within the last 20 years that his theorem was solved, and it was a big deal. And the, the person that solved it, the mathematician that solved it, was on the cover of Time magazine and everything. So um, both very prolific mathematicians wrote a lot of stuff that helps us out today. So their achievements allowed geometry problems to be solved both algebraically and um, algebra problems to be solved geometrically. You know, put drawings with what we have and make it easier for people uh, to access math. So analytic geometry opened the door for Newton and Leibniz that developed calculus. And then we've already had some experience with circles. We know that they're pretty basic. If they're centered at 0, 0, Or not, you know, if they have a new center at H and K. So it is generally where we go after circles. Like I said, because of state standards, everything got kind of changed. So a lot of history of conic sections. And you can read up there where we're talking about 250 BC to 175 BC. This stuff has been around a long, long time. And uh, of course, that means we get to benefit from that because there's a lot of great formulas that we get to use. So section 8.1, our objectives are going to be understand how conic sections are formed. We're going to understand the geometry of parabolas, not just what the formulas look like, but why they form the way they do. So that's the key features. And eventually, we'll get to writing equations for parabolas, translating parabolas up, down, right, left, and understand applications of parabolas. What we will not do will be turning them. And that's because that requires trig along with our two variable systems. And we just want you to see what conics are like, um, because they're, they're a lot of fun, <laughs> especially if you become a, a software designer. Um, Computers speak the language of math, you know, and you can draw and make shapes and do all kinds of things, even on your graphing calculator, for goodness sake, if you know what you're doing with these. So this is what I said before. This is called a double-napped cone. It's like two snow cone holders, one of them upside down, that meet at their points right here. So that is a double-napped cone. And imagine two non-perpendicular lines intersecting at this point V. So this is how this shape comes to be. You've got one line and another line, and they're going to intersect at that point. If we fix one of the lines, so we hold it so it can't move, and rotate the other one, then what we do is we generate what's called this double-napped cone right here. So the generator sweeps out a right circular cone with a vertex V. Notice that V divides the cone into two equal parts called naps. Um, each nap of the cone resembles a pointed ice cream cone, snow cone holder, you know, those types of things. So we've got an upper nap and a lower nap here. Now, that's the start of what we do with conics. Because what we want to do is see if we could slice through this double napped cone, what type of images would we see? And that's where we get our, our conic sections from. So a conic section, or sometimes they're just called conics. You know we hate to do words in math, so we try to shorten everything up. So a conic section or conic is a cross section of the cone, the intersection of the plane with the right circular cone. And the three basic conic sections are parabola, ellipse, and hyperbola. Now, in life, if you say someone's a degenerate, you're saying that person doesn't follow the, the social mores of what we're supposed to do in life. They do things they shouldn't be doing. And so it's kind of funny that we call some of the atypical conics the degenerate conic sections, you know, like they're the bad ones in the group. But what happens is they don't have all of the same characteristics that the other conics have. So because they are atypical and lack some of the features that are usually associated with an ellipse, 
a circle is considered to be a degenerate ellipse. It's almost like it doesn't have enough going on, you know, to, to make it a conic section, so it's a, a degenerate. Other degenerate conic sections can be obtained from cross sections of a degenerate cone. Such cones occur when the generator and axis of the cone are parallel or perpendicular. And we're going to see they've got a pretty good graphic up here. Um, it used to be teachers would stand in front with a double nap cone and try to show you all of this, but these are actually really good cross sections here that they have. So a cross section would be, like I said, if you can take a razor blade and just slice right through it and push down the cone, and maybe it had ink on it so that it would create an impression, then these are the cross sections that we get. Now the ones on the top, those are conic sections. So we can get ourselves a nice ellipse, parabola, or both branches by making sure that plane cuts through um, both of the cones and the double napped cone. Um, so those are going to be the conic sections. And below that, we see some degenerate cases where, where things are a little strange. Um, we could take our paper, our, our, our section that we want to crop, I want to say cross section, right here that we want to take out and, and have it just meet at the V, which is going to be a point plane through just that point only. You could have it so basically it just barely touches both sides of the double napped cone, but it also goes right through V, right in between that vertex there, and it creates just a single line. And then you could have two intersecting lines because you cut it through going vertically instead of horizontally. So this is the three standard types of conics and then three degenerate situations that are, are special cases. And the conics are what we want to study as we go further into this. So the conic sections can be defined algebraically as graphs of second degree quadratic equations in two variables, so both an x and a y, where a, b, and c are not all zero. Could look like that. And here's why I say could look like that. We're going to find out that parabolas only have an x squared or a y squared. They don't get both. So our job as we try to work through these sections is to figure out when we see something that looks like this, is it a parabola? Is it an ellipse? Is it a hyperbola? And how could we write it in standard form so it would be easy to graph it, talk about all of its characteristics, get everything that we need out of it? So I'm going to go back to the good old completing the square eventually when we have to do those things. Anybody need more time to get that down? All right. The geometry of a parabola. I hope you're saying, well, I've graphed parabolas before. Yeah, that's not the point of what we're doing when we're talking about conic sections. You know what an equation looks like because you covered quadratics. We've covered quadratics a ton with all of you. But you don't know why it got there. And that's what conic sections, the study of conic sections is about. Why did this form? What was really going on here? So a parabola is a set of all points in a plane equidistant from a particular line, and that line is called the directrix, and a particular point, and that point is called the focus. So why are you just hearing about this now? Well, because you have to go in depth into the conic sections in order to get this. You know, in Algebra 2, it's just, hey, can you graph it, you know, and see what it looks like. So we have this line called the directrix. The directrix, well, if you think of the root word, it would be direct for directrix. And what it does is it gives us directions. It's a line that says, don't go this way, go the opposite direction. That's what a directrix does. The focus gives us a point to make the parabola wrap around. That's what the focus is. So the line passing through the focus and perpendicular to the directrix is called the focal axis of the parabola. It is a line of symmetry for the parabola. 
and the focus is on it. You know, that's why it's called the, the focal axis. So the axis is the line of symmetry for the parabola. The point where the parabola intersects its axis is the point where the parabola intersects its axis is the focus vertex. We've got three three big things here. One we know, vertex. You guys have talked about a lot. Um, in fact, we did that earlier this year when we were graphing um, quadratics, but not directrix and focus. Those are the two pieces that we need. The vertex is located midway between the focus and the directrix. Now. I know they don't make a big deal out of that, but that's something we really need to know. The vertex is always halfway between the focus and the directrix. It's the point of the parabola that's closest to both the focus and the directrix. So down here we're going to get this great big blown up picture of a parabola so that we can see why parabolas form the way they do. So in orange, it says the distance from each point on the parabola to both the focus and the directrix is the same. That's what actually forms a parabola. So if we pick any spot on the parabola, we need to know that it's going to have an equal distance to the directrix and the focus. Any point on the parabola, doesn't matter where you are. So that means if we do pick the vertex, if we say, you know what, I want to see what's going on at the vertex, we're still going to have the distance to the directrix and the distance to the focus be exactly the same. But it could be a point way out here. The distance to the focus and the distance from this point to the directrix will be equal. That's what creates the parabola and makes it curve the way that it does. So now let's get an overall picture of what we see here. Parabola, yeah, we're used to seeing those. But now we notice, look how the parabola wraps around the focus. And that's what we're going to see when we talk about a focus or foci, which is the plural, with ellipses and hyperbolas. We're wrapping around that focus. And again, here's that line called the directrix back here, saying, don't you dare graph this way, graph the other way. So the directrix is here, the parabola opens this way. Now I think I've talked about everything that's up there. Well, the axis, that was just in the, the paragraph that we read up there. Here's that focal axis that's going through the vertex and the focus of that parabola. All right, so now we know a little bit more in-depth information about a parabola. Well, how am I going to know it when I see it? Well, like I said, parabolas only have an x squared or a y squared, not both, just one. And so the standard form for a parabola, upward or downward opening, is x squared. And if you're thinking, well, how am I going to remember that that's the one that goes up and down and then that y squared is right and left? Because you've spent years studying this one. You have only studied up and down opening parabolas at this point. You haven't done anything else. And standard form was ax squared plus bx plus c. So x squared we're used to. That's the up and down piece. Now, what we're not used to is having to give all this extra stuff about it. But if it's upward opening, we know it's going to wrap around the focus. Because we're not talking about any translations yet, and our vertex is always going to be at 0, 0, well, right here will be that distance from the vertex to the focus. And you'll notice we use p to signify that distance. It's actually called the directed distance. So we're wrapping around the focus. Here's the line. Opposite direction saying, don't go here, go the other way. So for our up and down opening parabolas, it's going to be a horizontal line. So that means when we name it, we have to say y equals, and in this case, it'll be negative p, because the distance from the vertex to the focus has to be the same as the distance from the vertex to the directrix. So we have to give them all that stuff. We have to be able to graph them, talk about them, and know everything that's going on. And we just have to get it 
write it into our heads right now. If it's x squared, those are the up and down ones. Already done those before. So the piece that becomes what we have to figure out is p. And p is the directed distance from the vertex to the focus. Now, why do we say directed distance? Because we might have to use a negative. This one has a positive p value, so it's opening up because its focus is positive. But this one is opening down. And so the directed distance here would be negative. We have to make sure we get a negative into our equation. But again, they always wrap around the focus. We always have the directrix behind it saying, don't go this way, go the other way. So now we shouldn't be shocked to see that the right and left are y squareds, which we haven't studied before. So these will be new. But again, we realize if things make sense in math, if they're logical, when this is positive, it'll open to the right. Yeah, they are logical. That's what happens. And if our directed distance p is negative, well, then when we put that negative value in, it's going to open to the left. So up and down, x squared. If there's a negative, down. y squared, right and left. If there's a negative, left. Again, they wrap around the focus. They have this line, the directrix behind them, saying, don't go this way, go the other way. And we're going to be able to find it because the distance from the vertex to the focus is the same as the distance from the vertex to the directrix. So far, so good? A lot of new stuff to keep track of, but not the toughest stuff in the world, right? OK. So now, seems like the one thing we have to really manage here is, is p, because if we know what that is, we can write equations for parabolas. So we need to know p is called the focal length. And most of the time, I'm just going to talk about that as the distance from the vertex to the focus, or the distance from the vertex to the directrix. So directed distance from the vertex to the focus means we do want to pay attention to whether or not it should be positive or negative, because that's going to tell us which way our parabola is opening. And then a chord. That's not a new word. That's from geometry. And a chord is a line segment with endpoints on the parabola. That's going to help us graph these without having to find a lot of points for it. And then the absolute value of 4p. Everybody always says, why the 4? Remember, people have been studying these since 250 BC, for goodness sake. The 4 shows up, trust me, every time when you're graphing the parabolas every time. So a 4 is part of the formula. And this 4p, the absolute value of that, that's called the focal width. Again, that's going to help us to get some easier graphs. Because what it tells us is the length of a chord through the focus and perpendicular to the axis. So when we have a parabola, and they've given us a focus, We'll see what 4p is without whether or not it's positive or negative, just 4p. And we'll be able to divide it in two and find another set of points, because obviously we'll know what the vertex is at that point. So that we don't have to do a lot of numbers in a table to graph these. That'll help us out. So this is the focal width right here. All right. Don't memorize the table. <laughs> oh my gosh, look at that table. Don't do that. These are very visual. So think, hey, if I have x squared, I'm going up or down. Make a sketch, you know, and, and you'll immediately know where things are supposed to go. y squared, look for the negative if it's going left, positive if it's going right. And then again, think about where everything needs to be when you're talking about a parabola. But if you forget when you're doing the homework, I suppose this is a good place to go back and take a peek at. So all of this that you see right here is really instinctual if you draw it. So um, we're going to have one of these big things for parabolas with a vertex at 0, 0, parabolas with a vertex at HK, 
um, ellipses at zero, zero, ellipses at HK. I mean, the, then we're going to do the same thing for hyperbolas. The one thing that's going to be brand new here that we need to think about is that focal width, the absolute value of 4p. Again, the 4 is a part of parabolas. It happens in the formulas. So down here, it says, finding the focus directrix and focal width. Find the focus directrix and focal width of the parabola. Y equals negative one-third x squared. And there's a hint here, because this is the first time we've looked at one of these, that this is not in standard form. It's not. In standard form means we have either an x squared or a y squared by itself. So you can go back up here and, and take a peek at that. Here's our standard form so that we can find everything. Well, that would mean I need to multiply both sides by negative 3. to get that in standard form. Now the next thing I do is I figure out, what are we talking about here? Up, down, left, right, which way is this going to go? And I see it has an x squared and it has a negative. It's going to go down. So I just make a quick sketch. Vertex at 0, 0. To start off, we'll start with the easy ones with the vertex at 0, 0. And then I remember they wrap around the focus. And I'm going to need a directrix back here saying, don't go this way. Go the other way. And all of that comes from the fact that we have this 4p in front of y that we have to find. Well, notice the y's match, the x squared's match. So pretty obviously, 4p had to come from negative 3. That's the only way that's going to work. And if we divide both sides by 4, and now I'll use my visual to figure out where everything is at. So the first thing we were supposed to find was the focus. Oops, I better spell it right. Well, I just found out the directed distance from the vertex to the focus is going to be negative 3 fourths. So that would put this point at 0, negative 3 fourths. Once I know that distance, I can certainly write an equation for the directrix. Because the distance from the vertex to the focus is exactly the same as the distance from the vertex to the directrix. So if this is 3 fourths, well, then this is 3 fourths. So that's going to be the line y equals 3 fourths. Focal width, this is the one I said you actually have to think about a little bit. That focal width is the absolute value of 4p. So I'm going to put fw. But when we set this up, we found out what 4p was. It was negative 3. So the absolute value of that will be 3. So the focal width is 3. If we were going to graph it, we would split that up into one and a half units on each side. We didn't have to graph it. We just needed the visuals so we could see, hey, this is where everything goes. And once we have that, 4p is the one thing we have to remember for parabolas. All right. Finding an equation of a parabola. Find an equation in standard form for the parabola whose directrix is the line x equals 2. Again, it's visual. Draw. And whose focus is the point negative 2, 0. Well, we really only needed to know that it was going to have a vertex at 0, 0. And that directrix, because the directrix, again, tells us, don't go this way, go the other direction. So my parabola, I don't want to get this solid just yet, because I do want to graph it with you, too. But I know my parabola is going to look something like that, which means it's opening to the left. 
So should we use an x squared or a y squared for this one? Yep. And first thing I'd want to do is figure out, well, what should I use for p? Directed distance from the vertex to the focus. Well, it's right here, for goodness sake. Negative 2. There it is. Now, find an equation in standard form for the parabola whose directrix is the line x equals 2 and whose focus is the point negative 2, 0. Well, we did that, but I want us to get a little more practice at the graphing here. So the focal width part, like I said, that's the part that's going to be toughest for everybody to remember because it's just a formula, you know, absolute value of 4p. Well, it's going to be absolute value of negative 8, which is 8. So now, instead of just guessing at how wide this parabola is, I know that if I have a perpendicular line through my focus, it's going to go four units up and four units down from my focus. And depending on what you want to do with it, that might just be enough, you know? On a test, I'd say, well... Cedar Home likes to see everything that goes out there all the way to the, you know, the negative 10 part, if I can fit it. So this would be a spot where we say, maybe we better go ahead and make a little table here. So we'll solve our little equation for y by taking the square root. So y equals plus or minus the square root of negative 8x. And because of everything we did, we know we should be putting negatives in there anyway, so we're not too worried. But what I would want to do is pick a number that, if I can, will make this nice. So I start thinking, well, I don't have any nice perfect squares until I get to negative 8. Negative 8 times negative 8 would be 64. So I'm going to put negative 8 in there and get plus or minus 8 back. So at negative 8, I can go up 8 and down 8. very accurate graph of what's going on with that parabola just by focal width and then using one set of points. So So let's get some more practice at this one. Find the focus directrix and focal width of the parabola y squared equals 12x then sketch a graph. Is that already in standard form? Yeah, you've got the y squared all by itself. So help me out. Up, down, right, left. Which way are we going with this one? Yeah, this is to the right. It's a y squared, so it's right or left. It's a positive 12. Going to go to the right. I need to know what p is. Then I can put everything up here. So I remember y squared equals 4px. Hey, the y squared is already a match. The x is already a match. 4p, pretty obviously, comes from the 12. And if I divide both sides by 4, I get a 3. So if it's going to open to the right, and again, because this doesn't have any hk pieces on it, we know it's going to have a vertex at 0, 0. Where is my focus going to be? So now oh, I'll put a little F by that. Focus. Think about where that directrix, the line that says don't go this way, go the other way, where would that be? Yep. Back here. And don't cross me. 
go the other way. So we've got focus and directrix taken care of. Now we need focal width. What's the little formula? And most of the time you realize, well, I already did 4P when I was trying to figure this out. So since it's already positive, that's going to be 12. So that tells me how far to go up and down on my focus over there. So how far up and down should we go from our focus? Six units. Yeah, if it's on a test, I'm kind of looking at that and I'm thinking, oh, I need a little more to the right. You know, just another number or two off to the right over there. So we solve for y. And I try to find a number that would make this nice. So I realize we're at 3, putting a 4 in, square root of 48 is not perfect, putting a 5 in, a 6 in, a 7 in, an 8 in, it just, it's not going to happen. So then I want to pick something out here and just give it a try. So maybe I'll put, oh, let's try 7. So we'll need 12 times 7 which is 84, and the square root of 84. Oops, I always forget this one doesn't need parentheses. So 9.165 for graphing will definitely be enough. But plus or minus, which I didn't leave enough room for. And that tells me I've gone out as far as I can go anyway because I'm probably going to be outside my range of 10. So 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, and not quite 10, a little more than 9. 9, 8, 7. And a very accurate parabola. And yeah, I know it said sketch a graph, but we're not sketching because when we get to the test, we graph. That's what we do. So focus, directrix, focal width. Got a graph. Good to go. How you feeling? All right. So that means this is a good time to stop. We need to do some homework on this and feel like we know what we're doing. And that's why there was a piece of graph paper on your desk when you came in. We're not graphing them all, so don't get carried away. Make sure you follow the directions. Sometimes they just say, find the focus, the directrix, the focal width, and then go to the next problem. So um, there will be some graphing, and we need that. We need that visual. And yes, we are taking three days on this. I, I hope it seems basic. And that's what we want to continue. We want to have that feeling for you that, yes, this is, this is basic. We don't want to run ahead too fast.